If you were in Monaco in early April, you would have seen these two wandering around, looking for uh, an Airbnb somewhere. Gambling away your money. Fid fid <laughs> fiddling with keys, trying to figure out how to get to their place. They finally got there. They spent some time, and they came up with MLOPS, 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 one of those. Uh, without further ado, Paul and Moritz. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thanks for coming here. Um, hands up, who has already dabbled in machine learning or generative AI? Okay, that's good. Um, who's not used Houdini? Okay, <laughs> that's our crowd. I'm one person. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so yeah, uh, welcome to uh, this session on uh, MLOps, 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 whatever you want to call it, machine learning inside of Exodini. And the thing is, when you're currently covering machine learning or you're trying to dabble in it, you are greeted with this mishmash here. This is the landscape you're currently, um, currently experiencing. And I want to point out this. Um, yeah, but fear not, we are here to help you embrace it, hopefully, with this flashy tool. And by that we mean AI, right? Yeah, AI, not the way. Um, so that's MLOPS, um, now if even more machine memeing. Um, and um, before we start into that, for people who don't know us, who are we, or more precisely, what are we? And here are some comments that we received online. We are amazing teachers. Wow, thank you. We're generously sharing always. We're idiots. We're notorious, and this is an inside quote from Side Effect, and it's been confirmed by Jeff Laid, one of the most clever people I know. Um, so without further ado, this is Paul Ambrosiusen. Um, used to work at Side Effects, um, used to lead the uh, labs team, um, lots of tool development there, mainly focused on real time, yep. and now at Business Consultancy. And me, um, formerly at iSponsor, doing 3D design and stuff, um, developed or co-developed motion operators for Houdini. So if you're into motion graphics, maybe you've dabbled into that. And I focus on generative art, and uh, I now run Entapma. Like, comment, subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, machine learning in Houdini. This has been done by a few people before, um, and I think one aspect that sets MLOPS, MLOPS, whatever you want to call it, apart from the other, is um, the approach we decided to implement here, because we tried implementing it in a modular way. And what you're seeing here is your standard tree for inferring using stable diffusion. Because in the end, who wants a monolithic tool that just does one thing when you can have a setup node that allowed you to fail in multiple ways? <laughs> um, and not only do we allow you to create cryptic error messages when inferring from stable diffusion and when creating stuff, but also we allow you to create cryptic error messages when training your own networks in Houdini. And that's what Paul going to cover. Yeah, so training is one of the focuses that we had for uh, the second iteration of MLOps, because the first one, as was mentioned earlier, you know, we did in early April. Uh, we did a second iteration where we moved beyond the um, stable diffusion workflow, and we wanted to focus on some you know, other things that are also available in uh, generative AI. Um, one of such things was uh, training in TOPS in PDG. Uh, we implemented uh, Dreambooth training, uh, which you may or may not have used already for uh, the stable diffusion work that you're able to use. Um, it is able to produce either you know, full uh, weights, but also LoRa weights, which are you know, uh, you know, fairly small in terms of size compared to a full set of weights that you would download. Um, all of this is also possible with remote training using um, Deadline, uh, using your uh, scheduler. Uh, we also added some other cool tools like uh, latent space visualization via UMAP, which uh, more will cover later about, uh, including you know, image similarity measurement as well as prompt similarity measurement. So training, let's take a look at that uh, first. Uh, so like I said earlier, we had our stable diffusion nodes already, um, but a lot of times, you know, studios say, hey, you know, great, we just can't use it because these uh, weights that you're using in stable diffusion have been trained on perhaps copyrighted material or, you know, have other issues with it. So if you're able to train our own set of weights, um, you know, you can make sure that all the data that goes in there is actually possible to use. So the first thing that we implemented is the pix to pix HD uh, model by NVIDIA, which allows you to train an image-to-image -image translation model in a single node. So this is not a new thing. It's been there for many years, I think. Um, but it allows you to do really great things. And it's actually also one of the things that side effects showed during the 17.5 launch, uh, where they introduced PDG, you know, where you're managing lots of files. You're able to do um, uh, multiple processes doing terrain erosions. Um, but they didn't quite tell you how to actually do it. They only showed you how to generate the data, but not how to actually use it in a machine learning model. Uh, so we wanted to 
essentially take up that whole workflow, put it in a single node, and just allow you to just use it as if it is Houdini without really needing to understand you know, a lot of Python coding and a lot more like that. So what allows this, uh, what can you do with this? Um, so what you see here is an example of um, training a pixel pix model that uh, converts the semantic input label that you see here on the left into a synthesized output on the right. Now, this semantic input label, all of these colors represent basically something, right? That's what makes it a semantic label. Uh, the purple that you see there where the road is represents a road, right? And so essentially what you're teaching here in this model by giving it lots and lots and lots of examples, right? Lots of semantic input labels as well as real life data that you're translating towards. You're essentially telling it purple color, uh, the color purple, sorry, means road. So now when you show it um, something that you draw yourself where you're saying, hey, I have this semantic label that I've drawn myself, I want you to generate an output that, you know, corresponds with what we trained you on. Here's another example of that, what people do with it. Uh, you can, for example, also do the opposite, right? Instead of giving it a semantic label, you can give it an actual input image and train it to do something that you, know, you can use in production. For example, here you have a satellite image of uh, buildings and uh, trees and whatever else. And what you see on the right is what it translates it into, which is a set of, uh, you know, essentially a Google Maps style uh, image. Next to it, another example of a building. Uh, so an example here, which is something that I attempted a couple of years ago, is you have this building, you translate it into this map that you see on the right, which then potentially you could break down even further into an actual syntax that you could feed into, for example, a building generator in Houdini that would convert an image that you see on the left into an actual 3D building uh, with geometry on it. Now, of course, those are some, uh, some, some okay examples to look at, uh, but you can also do really cool artistic stuff. So here's an example that NVIDIA also shows on our website by uh, Scott Eaton. Uh, where he actually uses uh, pix to pix to create actual bronze sculptures, uh, which is the output that you see here. Um, so what they did is they trained a model with lots of sketches and lots and lots of actually sculpted images and translated it from a sketch into an actual you know, um, render of a, of a bronze model, which then at the end they can use as reference for sculpting the actual real thing, which is what they did. And here they trained it on about 30,000 sketches as well as you know actual photographs of uh, models that they created. Now um, coming back to that example that you know side effect showed and this is uh, what they released. They released a hip file showing you how you can create these sets of um, uh, data that you can use to train a model with. It would generate essentially um, an input image right which is your uneroded height put uh, height map and then an eroded version of that. So you can translate from an uneroded version into an actually eroded version. And what you can do with this is basically skip the whole erosion process. And that's what we see here. In the top, you have a version that is eroded using the erode sop, right, in landscapes. And the bottom one is uh, evaluated using pix to pix And because it's not doing erosion, it's just an instant result you get. And you see here that the result they got is about 50,000 times faster, which of course in production would be great to have everywhere, right? So side effects, please, you know, continue this trend. Um, so, you know, presenting Houdini, of course, uh, Houdini is a perfect uh, platform for creating synthetic data. We all know that. We can use it to create um, content with it, which fits perfectly with our plans for training, right? We can use Houdini to generate all the content with, and then we can train on it, and then we can evaluate it in Houdini or infer with it in Houdini to do even more cool stuff with it. So this zip file, uh, once again, very simple example. We start off with just a basic height field of uh, 512 by 512. Uh, we then just run an erosion sop over it, right? So this is where it actually gets expensive in terms of computation. So we, for example, generate 10,000 examples of this. Uh, this is the part where you basically offload the computational cost to before production, right? Um, and then what I did here is basically take the eroded version. Here we get some. Chris is, Chris is gesturing out near mic is running a bit. Mine or, or his. I'll hold it. Um, <laughs> Then here what we do with the two height field output SOPs is we export the uneroded version on the left, and then afterwards we export the eroded version. Now, there's a little uh, trick, of course, as usual. Uh, you can just use a Python SOP to press the buttons that hit export on there. Uh, some people don't know, but it's really great to use that. And here's an actual pro tip. So if you want to um, force a certain cooking order in Houdini, you can use this trick. So you put down a merge SOP, then on the uh, leftmost input, you put the SOP that you want to be cooked first. And you can do that by uh, putting down a null SOP and just unticking the box that says 
uh, copy input. And what this will make sure of is that every time the graph gets evaluated, that node does not have any cache, which means that it's going to get recooked. And so by doing that with several null SOPs, you're able to force a specific cooking order, which in this case with erosion is great and will um, optimize your memory a little bit. Now, the output of this uh, is, of course, these two images, right? We have our semantically labeled image. In this case, it's just a height field or a height map. And on the right, we have our um, eroded representation of the height field with all the different um, channels. So for example, the water, the debris, all of these are composited into a single image. And the goal is to train from the left, the uneroded version, and have it immediately give us what we see on the right. Now, the other thing, of course, that we also did in terms of training tools is allow you to train you know, your own stable diffusion model, or fine tune it rather, uh, using DreamBooth. And instead of you having to open up a Python environment and uh, run a script that you found somewhere online or you've modified with lots of arguments, once again, it's just a, a PDG node where you can change the parameters uh, for it to be training in the way that you want, uh, distributed somewhere else. You don't have to manage you know, your environment that much. You just let PDG do its thing. Um, and all of it, of course, can be driven by attributes. So once again, a fully procedural setup. You're able to train even wedges of a model with different learning rates um, just to your liking. Now, what is DreamBooth itself? Uh, DreamBooth itself allows you to fine tune a model using very few examples. So what you see here on the left is uh, just a couple of images of this Corgi. And then afterwards, after you've trained it, you plug those LoRa weights into your um, solver where you're then able to say, you know, this dog in the Acropolis there, or in a dog house, or in a bucket. And this model has now been fine-tuned so that it knows what this image of a dog looks like, and it can make it look different in a different context using that same concept that you trained it on. Now, of course, also doing that on uh, some images uh, of myself uh, for testing. So this is a set of images that we took uh, on a different trip. And then, uh, of course, running it through the, the training nodes. Once again, you can do it local if you want, or you can use it uh, on the deadline scheduler. So push it off somewhere on a server or on a server uh, that you have yourself in a studio, perhaps. So train locally or distribute it. Uh, but the thing with training, of course, is that you want to keep an eye on the training, right? Is this successfully training, which is somewhat difficult to do in Houdini. Um, but we'll see how to get around that. Now, this, of course, are some outputs. Uh, we trained the model to uh, have an understanding of uh, what my face looks like. And then here we see a couple of different uh, representations of that. So as an astronaut, as some person in the Middle Ages, uh, and various other uh, poster style images. Now, so what I was saying earlier about uh, keeping an eye on the training itself, we also did a TensorBoard integration, which allows you to keep track of uh, the training itself or any other sort of scalar or image or uh, hyperparameters. Um, without doing any significant work, right? So we made a SOP for it as well as some utility tools. So how do you actually use this? Uh, you just look at the training node or some of the training nodes that we've implemented. You copy that line that you have there. You open your terminal or command prompt. You hit enter and you're done. You just then click on the, uh, the link that is shown there, localhost, and it opens up a browser that shows you all of the progress on your training. Now, that same TensorBoard um, utility, we've also just made a SOP. So if you have a SOP network with geometry, with attributes, with whatever you have, um, you're also just immediately able to push that into TensorBoard. Now, what do you get then in TensorBoard? In TensorBoard, you can actually see all of those attributes uh, basically visualized over time. So I think essentially think of it as uh, a geometry spreadsheet over time, right? So really convenient beyond just training purposes. Now, as I said earlier, uh, it has been implemented as a SOP. So if you want to do custom stuff with it that we did not plan uh, for you to do with it, you can. But we also um, added it as some utility functions to the MLOps utils uh, so that you can call it from anywhere. So if you have custom scripts or tools that you'd also like to do some uh, tracking or monitoring online with, just call these lines of code and you're good to go. So as you can see, you can do text, you can do images, you can do scalars, but you can also do geometry. Now, so here we see that in action, we're just going to copy that line uh, that is there, put it in the terminal, hit enter, it's going to boot up a local server, click the link, it'll open your browser, and there you go, you now have all your data. So here's our scalar, uh, scalar represented over time. We have an image that we can also view, we also have text, but you're also able to view actual meshes. So if you want to see a mesh progress over time, for example, you can also just push that directly into TensorBoard.
Oh yeah, that's my part. Um, the other thing that we focused on um, in this second iteration of MLOps is the analysis tools, um, or understanding what's, or getting a better grasp of what's um, going on in your model or in your machine learning tools. So most of you have heard the expression of latent space, and you're like, when I was hearing that, I was like, what the, what the hell is that? What is a latent space? How? I mean, Matt Epp was talking about visualizing four-dimensional spaces here, and that's for amateurs. We're talking 50,000 to 70,000 dimensional spaces here, and how do you visualize that? You don't. Um, the thing is, the mental model that I want to give you is like Matt mentioned, the projection of one space into another. Think of it like this way. You have your flat plane there, um, and you shine a light onto those 3D objects, and you get a 2D shadow. And depending on where those objects are, where your light source are, the image of the projection might differ a bit, but you still get a good idea of what the objects look like. Does it have sharp corners? Is it round? Yada, yada. We can do the same thing with our 50,000 or 70,000 dimensional embeddings. That means the vectors that describe the text that you prompt something for. And this is what it looks like, for example. In this case, I prompted uh, in between the pizza space down here, and up here we have parrots. There is the island of watches. And in between, we have a weird mixture of dudes wearing um, uh, tuxedos and tools and um, depending on what you set up this might make more sense or less sense um, but that's this visualized but also you can see stuff that's very sensible so here I blended between different prompts the prompts were a parrot a tuxedo and a parrot wearing a tuxedo and when you see that you get this nice round trip between all those prompts in the space so you can see that they are actually semantically connected um, through those paths in between where, uh, where we are interpolating between those different concepts Here's one more. Um, again, this time not a straight interpolation, but um, added a bit of noise between pizza and parrot. And when you look in here, you can see that pizza degrades really well because it has really um, regular structure here. So it keeps its appearance really well, even though we're div diverging from the center of what pizza is. Um, not so much with the parrots. Um, yeah, and this is the tool in action. You can see this here is my prompts that I blend, so I blend between an image of a cat, a rhino, a car, and I think a jet plane. Yeah, jet plane here. Um, the second, um, so down here, I am converting all these prompts into embeddings. And embeddings are just these high dimensional um, vectors with 50,000, 70,000 numbers. Down here, in this loop, I am creating an image for each of those prompts, and then this is the final visualization node. So only these two nodes here can visualize and project that down into a space that makes sense. A space that can have n dimensions. In here, I think we implemented one, two, and three dimensions because anything else was, we had a problems wrapping our head around here. And again, these uh, parameters drive from where you want to project those down to your two-dimensional or three-dimensional image plane. And then when you zoom in, you can see this line here interpolated between those individual prompts. And when you zoom in, you can see your individual images here lined up. And so, yeah, that's just interpolating between those different concepts. Again, works in 2D or 3D. So usually if you would publish rather um, a 2D version would make more sense. But if you want to animate this, 3D it is. So for the next thing that we are implementing currently, um, we need to do a short interlude, um, stable diffusion and how it works in two minutes. Um, even if you have an idea, here's the gist of it. So stable diffusion in a diagram is you prompt for something, in this case a parrot wearing a tuxedo. This gets converted in so-called tokens. It's just a dictionary, just a lookup. So in this case, A is the number 320. The other tokens here are the start and end tokens. So A is here, 320 and 320. And then parrot, for example, is this number, et cetera, et cetera. This then gets fed into your first neural network, which generates those high dimensional vectors. In our case, I think we are using 77,000 vectors with stable diffusion 2.1, um, and these are just floats. So basically 77,000 floats. And these kind of give you the direction in this map that we created, um, that the uh, neural network learned of what the world is as a concept. And where on this map do we start? Well, we randomly pick a location by choosing um, just noise here, which we then feed into this thing, which is a unit which um, denoises this noise step by step and tries as an input to keep the direction of this contact. So try to denoise it, but in the direction of a parrot wearing tuxedo, and that's your output. So basically that's your stable diffusion as we've known it so far. Just this simple single unit fed in with a bunch of embeddings trying to denoise um, a noisy image. 
Now, since a few weeks, I think, it's publicly out there, which is Stable Diffusion XL, with, which is the new-ish architecture, the new-ish release of Stable Diffusion, which is finally getting to a point where it's um, equivalent again with other competing tools, such as MidJourney. Um, and in here, we are doing the same thing. This is the representation of this thing here, basically. But now we are using two of them. So we are only partially denoising a first image, what we did in the previous slide, and then feeding it in an image-to-image -image refiner. So we already got an image out here, just a bit noisy-ish, and then running the same process over and over again, second time, to get our final image, which has a 1K by 1K resolution. And I'm telling you this um, because this is one of the few things we've been thinking with recently. Um, and this is the implementation of Stable XL and its current form. Um, you can see there a rather compact code compared to what it is. And me just prompting here for um, a capybara or a giraffe in space. And um, this is the standard model that they provide. No tune, no specific Civit AI weirdness downloaded. Um, that's just the model they provide. So really high quality for what it is at a um, rather high resolution, I think. So um, Stable Diffusion XL will be coming in hopefully the soon. next release. It's coming, yeah, let's say soon-ish. <laughs> Cool. So a couple of uh, community works uh, in between uh, because, you know, since we released MLOps, uh, we've had over 1,200 people join the Discord. Uh, so I'm really curious to see how many people are, you know, using it beyond just people that uh, have joined the Discord. But here's a couple of examples from, you know, what people have posted on Discord. So that's just a tip if you want to be featured in the next talk, you know, post on Discord. Uh, here's an example where someone uses the... Um, Stable Diffusion uh, tool to create tiling textures. So what they do is uh, make use of the little new checkbox that we have that says tiled uh, on the solver itself, which will make sure that the solved output is actually fully tiled. And what they do is um, basically prompt for a certain image, feed it some images from ControlNet, um, then put it on geometry, extract the depth map using the uh, control net auxiliary nodes that we've created, that will create a depth map itself, and then just bake it using the labs maps baker. And that produces pretty good results. Okay, I'll explain this before the music plays. Um, so since it is Houdini and uh, all of MLOps can be driven by attributes themselves, um, what you can do is actually drive the generation of um, these outputs using, for example, chops, where you're able to load in uh, some music. So let's just play it. So yeah, as you can see, you know the uh, the limit really is just your imagination in terms of what you feed into it. We've given you a control net, uh, you have all of Houdini to your disposal, uh, and you now have machine learning tools, right, or generative AI tools just at the uh, just right there to use for you, right? Yeah, we expose um, all the parameters that we have just as standard point attributes, and all the images also are stored on points, so that makes it very easy, or should in theory make it very easy for you to manipulate everything and uh, work with everything. The other thing um, that we've implemented recently um, under the um, analytics analysis branch, so to speak, is prompt similarity. Um, so how different can words be? Um, it's just a simple measurement of where in our learned idea of concept of words of human language do things lie and how far are they apart. And uh, I've tried with a few examples to find out um, what's the um, similarity between an oil tanker and love. And, um, <laughs> The thing is, um, in here, when we're, when we're looking at prompts, um, your similarity measures are always in the higher scale. So if something is really dissimilar, it's 0 0.75, but then it's really dissimilar. So take these with a grain of salt. Everything that's above 0.95 is similar-ish. Everything below, not so much. Yeah, as think you of it as here. a logarithmic scale. System. Exactly, a logarithmic scale, that's the big one. Um, yeah, myself and love is really similar. <laughs> Myself and intelligence is uh, not so similar, but still good. Myself and notoriety, side effects, is not as high. Uh, myself and narcissism is higher than notoriety. Um, Paul on notoriety is actually lower than me. Um, yeah. And an oil tanker and a photograph of J. Robert Oppenheimer hugging Barbie is the most dissimilar thing I could come up with. <laughs> 
So um, it's a simple single node which will spit out a similarity value of your prompts. Oh, and we have uh, image similarity in here. So how different can pixels be? And usually the most naive idea you'd have is like either pixel difference, which of course is a bad measurement, then you have structural similarity index, which we also have present in here, which still tries to figure out what kind of structures are in your image. However, what we can also do here is prompt for actual image content. So um, we can judge if, for example, these capybaras here, although structurally dissimilar, still are quite similar on the image scale here because they have kind of the same content because we now have a semantic idea of what's um, displayed in the image. And you can see the more um, we get towards this wise, uh, white spacesuit astronaut capybara, the similar we are. And we can also create something very dissimilar with this photo of Paul's dog. So again, a measure of um, how similar are images, but based on their actual content. Actually, we implemented this because we tried to find some ways of making this temporally more coherent. And you will see this in some of the um, examples we bring. Flickr has been a huge issue. Um, we are looking at current um, papers and current techniques that uh, reduce the amount of Flickr, and we are quite optimistic to be able to implement those. However, everything you see here still has a huge amount of Flickr. And to, uh, to come back to training, uh, this is also really useful for, for example, if you're creating uh, lots of uh, synthetic data sets using Houdini, for example. Sometimes, let's say you generate buildings, sometimes a building may seem off or something goes wrong in the generation of a building. You can use this to, for example, filter out bad buildings, right? To sort of clean up your uh, data set that you use for training. So, a few more things. Uh, a couple of people reached out that wanted to use MLOps you know, in their studio, but they said, hey, you have a proprietary license, which was still very generous and, and free to use. Uh, we changed it into a, a generic BSD3 class license, which means that no more non-standard licenses. You can just show this to your legal team, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, we know this. However, we waive every responsibility of the checkpoints that you use. They are totally on you. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And also it means it's open source. So if you uh, want to dig in and want to contribute, um, please do so. Some of the tools we've shown and we are about to show uh, have been developed by the community and we are thrilled about um, uh, the progress and the tools the community has built so far. So please, if you want to join, if you want to participate, GitHub, open yes. source. Let's do it. Uh, then another tool that we implemented is the segment anything model by uh, Meta itself. And it essentially allows you to just segment an image like this, just like that, right? And you can see there in the middle image, um, show it a picture like that, and it'll automatically segment it into different parts of an image that it understands. Um, and it works fairly well. Um, so here's an example of that node or that uh, algorithm implemented in Houdini on the picture like that. Um, feed it the image that you already have, for example, from stable diffusion or that you get from elsewhere, and it just automatically creates a class attribute for all the different segments that it extracted. The tool itself also allows you to feed in uh, a point which allows you to just say, this part of the image, I want you to just mask that thing, which is, for example, great if you want to composite things together uh, or roto things, perhaps. Um, it also allows you to point out things that you do not want to be part of your uh, mask. So if you, for example, have some trees in the background, you can just say, don't include those in my segmentation. So hopefully this is another nail in the coffin for manual roto. Hopefully. Yeah, we'll see. Um, then, so how can you use this in production? So here's a really cool example that, uh, that we found online. Um, just run that thing over an image of uh, a facade like this. Uh, it'll automatically try and uh, segment all of the bricks that are there. You now have your actual polygons for the brick itself, the silhouettes. Find some bricks or model some bricks yourself that fit in the right thing. And now you've automatically converted this picture of a facade into actually stacked bricks in Houdini, just like that, you know, in a couple of seconds. Now, some other tools that we implemented is this uh, camera to points node, and it allows you to do real-time renders of the viewport into SOPs, right? So if you have geometry that is, for example, animated, uh, or you want to post some characters and use it for control net, just drop this node down. No more need for doing a playblast or creating a screenshot of your um, viewport and putting that in. No, you can just use this node to have a live uh, input from the viewport into your SOP network. Now, the cool thing is this does, for example, a PBR render like that using OpenGL, or it allow also allows you to extract a depth map, which you can then use for control net, segmentation mask, and a couple of other things. Normal, I think. And that was it. Yeah, normal. normal maps. Yeah. Now, another tool that we also implemented is the uh, upscaler. So what you see here is uh, the node that just allows you to plug in some, uh, some low-res image, and it'll automatically try and up it into a much higher resolution. Uh, or even just imagine some details into an image. So if you feed it a rather low-resolution image, which is like literally pixel image, 
it'll create some very interesting looking results. But if you feed it an image that already you know, looks good in terms of resolution, this will just make it look even finer. And this node itself allows you to uh, select between different models that it will use for the uh, upscaling. So depending on what kind of use case you have, is it uh, people, is it cars, is it something else? Uh, you can use waifus. Uh, you can uh, pick the corresponding model to do that for you. Now, another thing that we also did because of feedback, uh, even though we made it a modular network, we also made it a not modular network. So we <laughs> took all of that and uh, put it in a monolithic node um, so that you can just use it uh, using the SD pipeline. Now, another tool, which is also showing in this video, is the uh, RemBG node. And what that will do is literally, similar to the uh, segmentation anything model, it'll find the subject of interest in your image and actually uh, mask out everything else uh, outside of uh, that particular thing. Now, here's a community tool um, using all of the tools that we've sort of given you with MLOps. Now, what this thing does here is really interesting. You're now able to basically just have some 3D geometry that is untextured. You can then use the camera to point to, for example, create a um, uh, renders of the same geometry from different angles, composite it together into a contact sheet, uh, extract the depth using the camera to points, and feed that into a control mat. Now, what, is, what that is going to do is, for example, with your 4 by 4 image, it is going to create um, a rendered version of that you know, grayscale geometry using the prompt that you've given it. So in this case, a pink horse or a real horse wearing, with red hair or whatever it is. Now, once you have that as an output from the stable diffusion nodes, you can back project that onto the geometry because you know exactly where the geometry was rendered from. Meaning, now you have this tool where you have some geometry, you prompt what it is you want it to be textured as, and it'll automatically texture it for you, which is, you know, really cool. Here is uh, that workflow basically explained uh, by a different user. Uh, we'll see here that um, they basically generated this contact sheet, right? The render of the head from different um, poses, which then gets back projected and blended back together, you know, using the mask you have, which means now you have this fully, you know, a textured object uh, from various uh, angles. And once again, since it's just Houdini, use your wrangles, use your SOPs, use whatever it is uh, to create workflows like this, right? We just, we've just given you a set of tools as a, a platform, build whatever production tools you want with it. But please do share with us. <laughs> now, uh, we also added some uh, uh, utility tools for images itself, uh, which are just useful beyond uh, what you do in MLOps. You can offset images, you can tile images, uh, you can up-res images, you can zoom in on images. Um, so it's basically just a small mini compositing um, sort of framework here inside of SOPs, uh, useful for the, the purposes that people want to use with Stable Diffusion. Again, all point clouds or grids of points, basically. Yeah. So you can even use it for things other than images. Um, then, we also focused on user experience. So, uh, with the first release, you know, it worked great, but we still had, had a lot of people that just dropped down nodes and were like, yeah, this doesn't work. And so, at some point, our Discord sort of got flooded with, you know, hey, I have this error, how do I fix this? So, what we did is um, actually implement, you know, lots of error handling for you. So, if you plug in nodes that are not supposed to be plugged in together, it tells you what you did wrong so that hopefully uh, you can just continue working. Now, we also added a pip install tool to the shelf tools. And the really great thing here is you just click the shelf tool. You say, I want access to this Python uh, library inside of Houdini. You hit install, and now you have this new library inside of Houdini. So no more manual managing of Python environments, fumbling around with Python path. Uh, you just hit that shelf button. Even if you're not interested in machine learning at all or waifu at all, this is the single tool that you should uh, install mops for, uh, ML ops for. Yeah. And this tool actually also is a community contribution. So people are just great in terms of sharing back to MLOps. Now, we also had uh, icons created for everything, uh, thanks to Shari Solo. So shout out to you, um, who created all of the awesome icons for the tools, uh, which are just makes it easier to work with, as you said. Now, beyond that, uh, we also focus on performance. Like I said, we made a pipeline node. Uh, all of it works in top-down autographic mode now, so no more fumbling around in the 3D viewport. You just hit spacebar 2 and you have a top view, uh, as well as error handling and a lot more stuff. Now, like I said, there is a lot more stuff. You can find that on the wiki, which we have also added to the GitHub, uh, which you can also access through that link that you see there at the bottom. 
The thing is, that, that, that slide has my color on it, but I think you typed it out because I wouldn't be as diplomatic with our future plans. So it says here, continued integration of industry standard ML tools, expansion of use cases for ML in Houdini, and widening of ML techniques in Houdini. So shall we spill the beans what that actually means? So the thing is, um, I've been nagging. So, so basically, the dynamics here is when Paul says we integrate, it means he integrated. Um, it means I come bitching to him and say, I can't do that, please implement. And he does that usually. And usually it works, most of the time. Yeah. Um, so the things I've been bitching to him about recently, and please um, join the Discord and join the bitching as well, um, is temporal coherence. We mentioned that. And the other huge thing, of course, is generation of uh, 3D data. The thing so far has been... Um, we're still looking at the, some of the research papers and still looking into the viability of implementing some of the solutions. They are still extremely resource hungry and the output don't justify the resources put in there sometimes, but um, that's what I keep bitching on about. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then again, actively listening and integrating community feedback. So again, join the Discord, join whatever outlets you want. Um, just make sure we um, are able to see it at some point. Um, and again, we have a bunch of community examples here, things our users created. Again, currently the Discord has around 1,200 uh, members, which is really, really nice. This one is one that's a bit more artistic by um, Jacob Weckel, Jakob Weckel, I don't know. Um, and you can see one of the issues here, again, the temporal coherence. In this case, it doesn't matter, I think, but um, one of the things we are working on. And here's a pitch to um, uh, all of you folks working in uh, the industry. Um, we are looking for an industry partner to continue evaluating MLOps. So um, is it useful in your pipeline? Is it usable in your pipeline? What or would what you like? would make it useful in your Exactly. Pipeline. What would you like to see in it? Um, and we, of course, are looking for promotional material that we can show in talks like these. Um, in exchange, we could this should we could provide um, individual training, priority bug fixes, feature evaluation or implementation, and of course consulting. So um, if you'd be up for that, hit us up. With that, it's thank you. So what you're seeing there in the background is just one um, uh, workflow from a more design-centered person um, who used um, uh, the toolkit to generate um, style frames, mood frames, and then turn those into those beautiful product renderings. And while that is running and looping, we are here for questions or insults or praise or whatever you want to throw at us. Anyone have an insult? Insults? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start off with those. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not an insult. We love you. Um, two questions briefly. First one, um, we're training your own data. How many images would you need to do that? So it depends. Um, usually with Dreambooth, you can be successful um, uh, with 12 images. Is the Dreambooth though relying on an existing model? Yes, or, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You're okay. fine-tuning so, a, a... So creating your own model, training your oh, own you're model? Creating your own model, yeah. you're looking at 10,000-ish. Um, but what you can do is you can do a um, iterative step. So you can train a really bad model then use that to output a ton of images, um, curate them, just delete the ones that you don't like and feed those back and iteratively generate your model again. But training from scratch is a bit more involved than fine tuning an existing model. Cool. But Second there are, uh, oh. to, to add to that, um, there are some uh, clean models, base models, I'll just call them, that you can use to fine tune. So if you're worried about um, uh, Copyrighted material being part of uh, weights, which is often the, the case uh, if people you know are hesitant in terms of using this, find a clean base model and just fine tune that. If you wanted to learn about a certain subject, for example, a dog or me, uh, you need fewer images than if you want it to be aware of a style. Then you need a wide variety of things. Cool. One more question too. Um, volumes. Have you considered that? Does that work with the tools that you've got? We. we what would you like to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I know with Pixar have shown a bunch of things about doing style transfer on volumes. One, one thing that I thought about from a long time ago, similar to your erosion example, is that if you could train the network on the, um, the pressure projection stage of a smoke sim, that's the slowest part. And if you could accelerate that using machine learning, that could be interesting. Yeah, that we have not looked at, but have a chat with uh, Jake Rice. I think he uh, looked at a couple of things. Cool. Other questions? At the back. I'll, I'll come over there after. Yeah, 
Hey, thanks very much. Um, yeah, another question um, on kind of how you see the future. Hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How you see the future of machine learning being used in 3D um, packages? Um, you know, I recently saw um, an imp implementation in Blender of using like a natural language learning model that, where you could describe what processes you wanted to do, and then of course it would do it in Blender. Mm -hmm. um, so, have you? How do you see? AI being used in the future in terms of interacting with these software, because I totally imagine a world where if I want to propagate my changes to a bunch of um, you know, uh, SOPs, I can tell the AI that I want to do that, or training on processes that I'm doing in 3D. Yeah, so what you could do uh, as an interesting uh, concept is um, since you're training it, um, for example, similar to the image to image translation, right? you could also train something that does image to parameters translation. So if you have, for example, a tree generator and you have a silhouette of a tree, the problem to solve is essentially, can you change the parameters of the tree generator so that it fills this silhouette? Like that is something that I would see as sort of the next step of where something like this should go in terms of assisting uh, tools inside of Houdini or you know elsewhere, but preferably Houdini. That being said, we currently um, also, and we, um kind of skip over this in all of our presentations somehow. Um, we have an implementation for uh, ChatGPT um, in uh, VEX. So it's really good at commenting your VEX. It's really good at um, finding um, errors or you know, diagnosing error messages. So that's one step. Um, the other step um, where I personally could see, and I'm going out on a limb here, this is speculative, um, where I could see the interaction of uh, machine learning uh, within the 3D pipeline is, well, content generation from scratch again, um, just, just prompting for 3D models. And in general, what we're, here, what we're seeing here with the advent of Nerf, with the advent of those tools, hopefully with tools that make it a bit more easier to um, texture and UV layout on your stuff, as well as with more powerful GPUs and more powerful um, game engines, I hope we are seeing the slow death of uh, structured mesh as your main representation. So. Um, getting rid of the focus and having a perfectly um, remeshed quad mesh with really nice aligned UVs. I think it's going to take a longer time, but it's, I think it is in the far future where we're going, hopefully. Nice. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a bunch of there. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's fantastic, really interesting stuff. Uh, I was wondering, what you're presenting is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, basically uh, under the hood, uh, placing these nodes, uh, the system is selecting certain um, models that are available uh, on the internet, right? I was wondering, uh, is there a, a possible plan in the future to allow uh, maybe to create a node-based system to to create our own single layers, uh, activation functions, and maybe make their our own thing? Uh, Not currently. Um, I think what we wanted to do first is focus more on the uh, um, user or artist center tools. Um, that's, it. I mean, it's doable. Um, it's a rather specific tool, I would say, at this point. Um, yeah, our, our goal at the moment definitely is to democratize sort of this technology for the larger audience. And I think um, what you're describing currently is geared more towards you know data scientists themselves. We really want to do this really really low level stuff, which Houdini is perfect for, by the way. Um, but right now we like more says want to focus on like artistic workflows. So Thank doable, you. but no immediate goal. Thank you. I think I have a question over here. Chris, there's also one in the front here. <laughs> Hi, I, I was wondering with um, when you were talking about the image to image training in PDG, is it um, currently the way it's set up? Is it possible to do like image to image where the input training is an initial image, a parameter, and then an output image? Something I've been thinking about is like using a physical sky and a bunch of scenes to output synthetic data. Um, at, that can take put any input image and like change the time of day to a very specific time. But I would that would be like a sliding parameter so that I could kind of see how it shifts and figure out exactly what time of day I want it set at. 
I think that's, that's, uh, that is one node that we already implemented, not in terms of training, but in terms of uh, inference. That's the uh, instruct picks to picks. Um, that one allows you to um, describe what it is you want to see happen in the image, and then it does that for you. So that is using a similar um, algorithm under the hood. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, I, I can see how it would work within like a, like a stable diffusion training where you could describe it or something. And to get an image to image, I guess I was just wondering if there's something where for like training your own full thing from towards a specific parameter. But I was just, never mind. Oh, good. No, 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 no. I was just no, curious. No, 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 it's absolutely a valid question. I'm just thinking about it. So the thing is to, to, to maybe answer a bunch of these underlying questions. The thing we are mostly relying on is basically the diffusers library, Hugging Faces diffusers library, which we implemented here. Yeah. Um, so if you find a way of implementing it using diffusers, it'll run inside of MLOps as well. Okay. And basically that's, that's our development workflow, um, trying to uh, get stuff to run first in a colab. Um, or locally mm -hmm. in a Jupyter a notebook, and then um, wrangling it into Houdini and um, designing a bunch of additional functions that make it easier for you to hand over data into Diffuse and getting it out of Diffuse into Houdini. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, thanks. It was a great presentation. Uh, thank you. A question How far do you think we are from being able to train like a, a data set from a low res simulation? Then uh, we we saw this 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 paper from Weta in Avatar that they they, they spawn some lines over it like in this place to give like uh, this the simulation look like much higher res because they have like these ripples on top. Uh, we created something based on that, and there is a relationship with vorticity. So is it possible to train data like on the flat surface and then you output a lot of like uh, high res just as a training data and then just based on the vorticity is going to trigger that displacement. So what you can already do is um, prepare a data set of your um, low res, high res um, uh, displacement um, and use that to infer new images and also you can just use the um, upresers um, to generate um, yeah, new, de new detail. The question again here is the temporal coherence. That's the most challenging, or still challenging, not the most, but, but still challenging, I'd say. It's rather but temporal coherence than the ability to train. In this specific case, the temporal co coherence couldn't be um, driven and stabilized by the vorticity data, like for like specific um, input that will just keep like, okay, if that's difference on the vorticity from this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, th yeah and there's already um, techniques out there. For example, for control net, we now have a um, video control net that um, is trained or is being trained on um, subsequent images to um, exactly get rid of that um, artifact. So um, yeah, we will see that coming. Again, it's not implemented yet, but um, I told you my bitch points too, Paul. <laughs> Great, thank you. Welcome. Chris, we have one here in, in front. I think um, you might be overlooking. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know about, about uh, generative, generative AI, but uh, it seems like having these like crazy n-dimensional vectors would lead to some pretty prohibitive hardware requirements. No, absolutely not, because a vector is just a list of numbers. But, okay. Um, and then, uh, so, like if if I wanted to learn more about generative AI in general, and mm -hmm. then also more about um, ML ops, like where would you recommend looking? I would go to the uh, the Hugging Face website itself. It's more than just being able to download models. It also has really extensive documents about um, how to use it. First of all, but uh, more importantly for you, what you're mentioning, it also explains everything really well. So that's definitely a, a starting point uh, with. All the knowledge you learn there is immediately compatible with MLOps because that's what we use ourselves. There's a really great medium side. I forgot uh, the person who created it. It's called um, the Illustrated Stable Diffusion. Um, and it explains the ins and outs of stable diffusion extremely well. And I think actually this SIGGRAPH on Thursday morning, there's a course. So um, five or six hour session. Sounds interesting. <laughs> Um, and then generally um, uh, for machine learning as a primer, um, I can recommend um, Andrew Glasner's book, 
whose title I can't remember, but if you um, look up Andrew Glasner, um, he's a brilliant um, visual explainer and it's a brilliant visual explanation of all the math from the get-go that goes into building your own machine learning models. Right. Sorry, what was that first uh, diffusion website that you mentioned? Um, the, face the, oh yeah, Hugging Face. Yeah, okay. Hugging Face and um, Illustrated Stable Diffusion on Medium. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. One more. I know there's a lot of questions, but we have to keep moving. We'll hang uh, around a bit. They will be hanging out inside. One more question here. Yeah. Just really quickly. Um, does, it, does it work with past versions of stable diffusion? Like if I had trained my own checkpoint model with stable diff diffusion 1.5, could yep. I then yep. upgrade that? Yep. Okay. Uh, 1.5 works with our tools, yeah. The only oh, thing okay. to keep in mind, though, is that uh, the different versions require different resolutions, so right. you may need to change some parameters for the uh, input noise and for the, the solve, but other than that, it works right away. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you for uh, making the tools, for sharing them with the community, with make, for making them open source, for working with us on it, uh, and for presenting today. Thanks thank for you. having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.